Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to Keele University's Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, my name is David Amigoni. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at Keele, uh, and it's my pleasure to um, chair this evening's event where we welcome Dr. David J. Phipps um, from the University of York, Toronto, um, to give our first lecture of um, the season. So it's our first uh, lecture of the new term at the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And for all of those uh, of you who are new to Keele, just to say one or two words about the Institute, it's run by my colleague, uh, Professor Jonathan Wassling, who's Pro Vice Chancellor for um, the, the Faculty of the Natural Sciences, where he's also ex Executive Dean, and he's very kindly allowed me to chair this evening's uh, event. ILAS is a vibrant, welcoming hub which distills our long history and commitment of interdisciplinarity uh, and teaching and learning, both in research um, and in, in pedagogy. The Institute promotes interdisciplinarity for all staff and students across all of our faculties uh, in the university. That's uh, humanities and social sciences, natural sciences and medicine and health sciences. It's also the home of two inspiring interdisciplinary um, degrees. Natural sciences and liberal arts, as well as the prestigious, and you're experiencing that this evening, um, Grand Challenges Lecture Series. Now, more information about ILAS uh, is available on our website, uh, which is www.keel.ac.uk. Um, backslash ILAS. So you can look there um, to see videos of previous Grand Challenges uh, lectures. So just a word uh, tonight about our first lecture because this is a new format for us. We're normally, uh, we would normally meet you in Keel Hall uh, in the centre of our uh, beautiful campus, um, but today uh, because of the COVID um, restrictions and cautions, we're going online and actually it's a real delight uh, and innovation for us to do so. One of the things you'll experience tonight uh, in the online lecture is an opportunity to participate um, and feedback some uh, responses to questions that David Phipps will ask. Now, David will go through um, the, uh, the, the interactive activity as part of his lecture when he's delivering it, but just to give you a heads up, it will probably be useful for you to have access either to a mobile device, a mobile phone, or another screen um, to help you with this activity. There will also, uh, in the course of the lecture, and um, following the lecture be an opportunity for Q&A and David is delighted to um, receive uh, questions and enter into discussion. So do use um, the Q&A chat line and the, the Q&A and the chat line that you've got um, as part of our team's setup. Just a word about using the Q&A. Uh, if you want to feed into the uh, event with Q&A, please make sure you use the Teams Q&A, the Teams Q&A rather than Slido. Slido is something that David will talk to you about and that will be for how you respond to some of his questions in the course of the lecture. OK, that is the kind of housekeeping things. Now, um, I'm really delighted uh, to introduce to you our distinguished speaker this evening, Dr. David J. Um, Phipps. Dr. David Phipps is Assistant Vice President, uh, Research Strategy at York University, Toronto, Ontario. Um, York University's address, incidentally, and I feel I should share this one with you because it's uh, <laughs> quite, quite, quite nice for our uh, for, for where we are, even if we're not all in Keel. Um, it's actually included. It's actually uh, its address is in Keel Street, um, and it's the same spelling, so we do feel a kind of an affinity um, with 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 York in Toronto. David manages all research grants and agreements, including knowledge and technology transfer for uni for, for York University. So that is a big job. He is um, the Knowledge Transfer Lead for Kids Brain Health Network and also the Network Director for Research Impact Canada. So he has very specific research, research responsibilities, but also for the entire national network uh, in Canada. 
He is also, as we'll see this evening, a brilliant public advocate of the impact agenda. He blends professional support with intellectual engagement. He has received honours and awards from the Canadian Association of Research Administrators, uh, the Institute for Knowledge Mobilisation and the EU based Knowledge Economy Network. He has received the, Queen's, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work in knowledge mobilisation and he was named the most influential knowledge mobiliser in Canada. Just this week, his very active Twitter account records that he has just been awarded the Herbert B. Chemizdi Award for Distinguished Contribution by the Society of Research Administrators International. He's a distinguished example of a colleague from the professional services who works at the interface between practical support for research and engagement and also the strategic leadership. Uh, of research. He is concerned to break down barriers both of disciplines but also professional affiliations and outlooks. So what is his topic tonight? Impact was introduced into the British REF 2014. Um, it's attracted lots of mixed views but the bottom line as far as I'm concerned is that I can't imagine any researcher who is indifferent to the idea that their research might make a difference, even if the knowledge it produces makes an incremental change. But let's move away from incre incremental change and let's think big, because to begin to advance the case that David will make tonight, impact is about changing the world, making a difference. Here, in this university, Keele University, we like to call it the Keele difference. But do we make that difference? Is our institution best placed to make it happen? So David's lecture tonight addresses those kinds of questions very squarely. And so I'm delighted to hand over to David as he delivers tonight's Grand Challenge lecture. Is impact your grand challenge? David. Thank you very much, David, uh, for the kind invitation for drawing the connection between York Keele University and our York University on Keele Street. Uh, amusing anecdote when you first emailed me and you said the University of Keele, we often refer to the Keele campus. I'm thinking, why is my university? asking me so it took me a moment to realize um, so thank you very much for this kind invitation just want to confirm you can see my first slide excellent so um, what I will do is um, invite the participants now to grab your handheld device your tablet or another screen and go to the at web address you see at the top sli.do type that into your browser function and when you get there, it will invite you to put in um, a presentation code. And ours is the number 92587. And what this will do while you're doing that, I'll just tell you what Slido will do. Slido integrates with this presentation. Fingers crossed that it does. And we'll integrate with this presentation. And I will be asking you some questions throughout so we can get a bit of interactivity going. We can find out who's in the room. We can understand, uh, learn a little bit about what's your experience with this work. And so I'll just talk a little bit more just to allow people to get to these screens. And um, this is, uh, I think, the first time that um, I was. Well, I, I view Slido as a as a participant, but not as a presenter. So it's been an excellent opportunity. And again, thank you to Keel for challenging me to uh, rise up to creating an interactive session. So hoping you're all there. Your screen should now show the the screen on your handheld device or other screen should now show this poll. And please identify. We want to know who's in the room. Are you academic staff? Are you non-academic or professional staff? Are you postgraduate or postdoctoral fellow? Um, are you non-academic research partner, maybe from industry or from a community organization, or you might be from, um, from a government organization? Maybe you're a general, um, a member of the public, and um, maybe someone who doesn't, um, none of these categories um, are useful. So we've had 22 people voting. And I and we'll just keep talking a little bit longer. And what's nice about the Slido function is you see the results coming in in real time. 
And so we've got postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows as the largest cohort of, um, of participants, I would say in the air quotes room. And I do want to again thank Keel for um, for for maintaining their commitment to the Grand Challenge Lecture Series, even through a time of um, of disruption as we are living in globally. So we see that we've got a, per, um, a, a large number of the 32% uh, uh, of the 31 participants reporting are postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Undergraduate students, excellent, thank you everyone. Academic staff, our faculty members and non-academic professional staff, there'll be people like me. And I'm delighted that there are some members of the public who are who are in attendance. So thank you very much for letting us know who's in the room. So I do want you to use the Zoom. Uh, sorry, it says Zoom. It's not Zoom, it's Teams. The Teams chat box. I just want to find out where your comfort level is in this um, in this subject matter. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being a Padawan and 10 being a Jedi Master, what's your comfort level for um, with research impact? Do you find, oh, I should also say for those who don't know Star Wars, um, Padawan is a uh, baby Jedi and someone who is just at the uh, learning stage of their Jedi journey and a Jedi master like Yoda is um, would be a number 10. And so I will, David, is it, are you looking at the chat box for someone else? I'm looking at it, David, yeah. Right, so what are we seeing from the participants? How are they, uh, how are they rating the, their own current capacity as um, uh, from a scale of Padawan to master? At the moment, we're not getting any um, new questions in the chat. I'm going to look at the chat line. Um, and so they're, people, being very, they're being reticent at the moment, I think. Well, that's all right. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a good audience that is sitting quietly and thinking deeply about the subject matter. We'll interpret it that way. But if someone does want to put in a number between 1 and 10, recognize just saying um, uh, where you feel you are in your research impact um, journey. Still reticent, David? At the moment, it is. All uh, right. It is, David. Yeah, yeah. Let me just well, let me just let me just try again. Let me just try. Still waters. So uh, okay. So so I have one one very um, one very distinguished um, guest who um, has put their rating down as a as an eight. Um, another academic colleague has put it down as a seven. Postgraduate student who put it down. Let me just. Um, yeah, so so other colleagues putting that between sort of um, high to high to medium, I would say, is the uh, is 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 the is 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 the, is the consensus so, by, by so far. And somebody anonymous did put down one. So. Okay, well, thank you, anonymous one. We are looking to build capacity, so you are perhaps the audience we are aiming to address today. But for the sevens and eights uh, in the room, um, and for everyone, we will be coming back to the slide at the end just to see if there's anything more that you have learnt as a result of um, of attending the this presentation. So thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for putting in comments into the um, not Zoom chat box. So uh, I took a look last year um, when, I, when I was thinking about this, this lecture and thinking, well, what was the grand challenge? And I looked at the grand challenges from last year, and, and they are very grand, and they are, there are a lot of challenges. Ethics, law, and the future of democracy. Public health narrative for anti-discrimination law. Can women ever win in politics? There should be a question mark at the end of that. How can we cure disease? And what is the role of people in an age of intelligent machines? Um, all of these grand and all of these challenges, addressing challenges. So I would invite you to go back to your phone, your iPad, your other screen, and just answer the question, what are some features of grand challenges? And this is where you get to type in a word or um, a short phrase. Complexity, so a number of people have typed in complexity. Um, impactful issues, thought-provoking, collaboration. I very much like that um, thought of collaboration. OK, sorry about that. Sorry about it must have been, am um, I going to say, my going to blame my headset. Still loud and clear? Still loud and clear, yes. Thank you. Widespread issues. Thinking outside your comfort zone. Thought provoking. Global reach, that's very important. Um, also global, overcoming a challenge. So thank you very much for um, putting in your ideas. We're getting more coming in right now. Entire population. So that would work in with global and with overcoming a global challenge. So, um, and then wicked problems. I do believe that there's a link between all of these, which are wicked problems. And for um, those in the room or participants who aren't aware of what a wicked problem is, 
A wicked problem is always complex. It's more than complicated, it's complex. Um, and as we start to study the wicked problem, sometimes our act of studying actually changes the problem itself. And it's very hard to imagine endpoints of wicked problems. So I'm just going to reflect. Thank you very much for that, uh, your participation. I'm just going to reflect on these grand challenges, intelligent machines, women in politics, public health, law, ethics, demo democracy and diseases. They all address a key social, economic, health or environmental or cultural challenge, and that was identified by the participants. They seek to make an impact beyond research output. So we do want to use research, but we do want that research to help inform decisions that will ultimately be used to be able to move the needle on the social, environmental, health, cultural challenges. And importantly for me, there's no templated approaches. How the type of um, the type of research you do in law is going to be different than you do in um, women in politics and different than intelligent machines. The type of partners you have are going to be different. The types of methods for um, for stakeholder engagement are going to be different and the way you measure outcomes and ultimately impacts are going to be different. And so with no templated approaches is impact the grand challenge of all grand challenges. And this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of today. So first, I want you to remember the good old days, the good old days of academic research and now acknowledging that there are a number of um, undergraduate, grad, postgraduate and postdoctoral fellows. You may not remember the good old days, but there will be some of us around this artificial table, this virtual table who do remember the good old days. And the good old days is where a funder would put out a call for grant applications into the institution. The institution would pass it on to researchers who would make a grant application and peers would review that grant application and give their results to the funder who would give their results back to the institution who would say to the researcher, congratulations, you've got to your money for your grant and your project, now please go forth. And um, those were the good old days. Today, the um, it, with impact on the agenda, it looks quite different. It used to work well in ivory towers, where in the old days of um, uh, red brick colleges, we actually built walls and gates. And I'm not sure if those gates were to prevent public from getting in or to prevent the professors from getting out. But we really clearly said that there is knowledge in here and it isn't out there. And more recently, this is the ring road around the University of Victoria in British Columbia and uh, in, in the west coast of Canada. And they have a ring road around the university again with the metaphor of this is where there is knowledge and out there, there be not knowledge. And so that was the, this, um, this good old days worked in this ivory tower mentality. But today we've got an impact agenda. I'm just gonna leave this slide up and I wanna confirm with David um, Amigoni that these slides will be made available to the participants. Is that correct? Absolutely, David. We will publish the slides. Uh, we will publish the slides afterwards. Great. Thank you. Um, to so to confirm, this is a book that was recently um, released. I would say recently at the end of the um, summer, and I encourage everyone who is interested in this to um, to get this book. It's a, a book of chapters and uh, written by these authors. Most of them are from the UK. And uh, and it's got the um, again, why I said, can you slide the um, can you slide or share the slides is all of these links are live and you'll be able to get to this book at the end. So um, this is not the good old days. This is in the impact agenda. The funders have are responding to government priorities. They're putting out research grant competitions that are responding to um, needs of government. They're also responding to other public policies like the research excellence framework, which David did talk about in his introduction. Institutions are also being driven by external forces. So again, there's an assessment system called the Research Excellence Framework, which I'm sure many of uh, you are, are familiar with, but also we are all being pushed very strongly by rankings. So the Times Higher Ed, Higher Ed Impact Rankings are a ranking of um, international rankings of institutions and their ability to articulate the, how they're moving the needle on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Researchers are also responding to external um, influences with expectations or even needs for public engagement or patient involvement if you're in some of the health and medical sciences. And increasingly, the grant applications coming out of funders are expecting collaboration with partners. And these partners are from non-academic um, organizations such as industry or government or community and nonprofit organizations. And your application used to have a pathway to impact and many grant competitions still do. Some of the UKRIs, there was a memo in January of this year that said we'll be removing pathways to impact. 
And I don't know if that's been affected by now or not, but also um, you didn't have to just do where you were not just assessed on your intellectual um, content of your grant application, but you now also assessed on your pathways to impact or your ability to describe how you're going to get from the research where you are to the impact that you want to have. And this is the interesting one, peer review. Is, um, is that this is the place that I don't see a lot of impact um, uh, happening. And I see um, the real opportunity for the sector is to think about how do we build the capacity of peer reviewers to adequately assess the impact sections in grant applications. And there's some work around um, on, on um, underway on that. I had the um, pleasure of being an external reviewer for the NIHR. Um, it was a global health um, grant, large scale grant applications. It was last year and these were 10 million, um, 10 million pound applications. So very large scale, all with an, um, a requirement to engage um, populations and partners. And, um, and as an impact person, they engaged me, they asked me to do a little workshop with the mainly scientists who were in the room. And I asked the question at the beginning, does everyone know what impact is and you're comfortable um, reviewing impact? And they all said yes. And then after half an hour of me talking about impact, I asked them to talk to raise their hands and the chair said, well, I think we understand what we don't know now. So I think there's a real opportunity to build the capacity of peer reviewers to be able to adequately review these sections of grant applications. So the question I have and what we will look at um, in the rest of this presentation is how do we move from an ivory tower to what the University of Lincoln has described as a permeable university? This is a manifesto that came out earlier this year or possibly late in 2019, but recently, and which talks about the characteristics of a permeable university as opposed to an ivory tower. And so a permeable university responds to an age of rapid, widespread opinion formation and amplified participation by connecting with wider society and this connecting with wider society that isn't uh, that to me is um, a characteristic of a permeable university we're not in an ivory tower we don't have gates to prevent the public getting in we are open to engaging with wider society and that means not only um, the publics various publics but also with um, with uh, industry with government with nonprofits with faith organizations both local and and global. And also a feature of research in a permeable university is responding to challenge-led research frameworks and funding. So we absolutely want to protect basic scholarship, basic science, blue sky science. That is just something that we should never take money away from in order to fund challenge-led. But increasingly, and funders are responding to the challenges identified by governments. And most funders outside of um, charities and foundations, funders are objects, they are instruments of government. And so it is not unreasonable that as an instrument of government, that so long as we're protecting the funding that is available for basic research, we are also having um, getting funding to do this challenge, challenge led research. And again, the link for this document will be available to you when these slides are disseminated. So I'm going to talk about some a concept and two tools that are relevant to the top three, three, three fifths of this cycle, and we call it research impact literacy. And research impact literacy has relevance to the institution, it has relevance to the researcher, and also has relevance to, um, to building that application. There is um, relevance to peer review, but as I said, though that is only in development right now. And at least in Canada, funders are very sympathetic to the concepts of research impact literacy, but they're not actually being driven by them, nor are they driving them. So much more a focus on the academic side of the equation. So this is the first um, iteration of research impact literacy. You'll see the publication I did with my colleague, Julie Bailey, who is at the University of Lincoln. <clears throat> and we published this in Evidence and Policy in 2019. We actually published it in Evidence and Policy online in 2017. It just took them two years to get it into print. But the idea is, and we came together as a Canadian and as a British um, scholar. And uh, in Canada, we don't have a ref. We're not assessed on the impacts of our, our research. We are, however, focused on how do we create re, um, these impacts. And that is a focus of Research Impact Canada. ARIS is Advancing Research Impact in Society, and that is a US network of universities and researchers. So we're focused on how we create, what are the processes that um, we create impact. But in, in the UK, in Australia, and in New Zealand, and in growing other countries in the world, impact is assessed. And while we also in those countries want to, we are interested in how to create impact, 
um, a dominant voice in the impact landscape is this assessment. And it is what it is knowing what impacts are occurring. And then the third element of this Venn diagram is who are the people that do this? Who are the, what, who are the people and what are the skills that they have? And the intersection, if we know how to create impact, we know what the indicators of impact are, and we know who are the people who are involved in creating impact and the skills they need, the intersection of this Venn diagram is we are calling literacy. And what we differentiate in Canada and the US, we call ourselves mission driven because we don't have an assessment and we do impact because it's right for the researcher, it's right for the institution. And in the UK and Australia and New Zealand and other places, um, we describe it as assessment driven and you are um, very focused on assessing the impacts in, in those systems. That was our first kick at the impact literacy can. Um, in 2019, late in 2019, we published um, a version 2.0 and we still had the who, the what and the how, but we've made some, we've combined um, organizational literacy as one element and individual literacy is another element, and we created levels of, um, of understanding of literacy. So for on the right hand side for individuals, are you aware that there is evidence in this space? The, the, the subject of knowledge translation of research impact of knowledge mobilization is a subject of scholarship. So are you aware there is evidence? Are you engaged with that evidence? Are you reading the evidence? Are you attending webinars like this one? Or are you critical of the evidence and really helping to drive the evidence base? And you can build the capacity by building your knowledge and having specific tools to help you work. On the organizational side, so this is universities and other research institutions, I don't know of a single institution that isn't supportive of, re of impact. No one says, oh, I don't want my research to have to make a difference. But then beyond being supportive, are they enabling of the impact agenda? Are they creating policies? structures that help researchers on the right hand side do their work and ultimately are they driving this work and so we've created the concept of these different levels of impact literacy but I think importantly also we've underpinned that with the why and the why was absent in our first kick at the impact literacy can and this is not only mission versus assessment but what are the values that you bring to this why are we doing this what are the ethics and also what is the purpose which is related to the why are we doing it and the the ethics of this is really interesting because we almost always assume that impacts are positive and we know especially in countries like Canada where we have centuries well certainly with academics decades long experience of having horrific impacts on our indigenous communities where we go in and we do research on indigenous communities and leave and take all of the evidence when with us and we never return it so so the ethics of this is something that is um, very underexplored in my opinion so from this concept of research impact literacy there are two tools that I want to present to you as opportunities to develop both your organizational and your individual impact literacy. These tools are freely available from um, Emerald Publishing, which is a global academic publisher, but based in the UK in um, Bingley near Leeds. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Institutional Health Check Workbook. And this is Institutional Impact Literacy. And we chose the word health check specifically because what we were observing in in the UK through the REF is some very unhealthy behaviors and pressures that were being put by the institution on researchers. And so we called it a health check workbook because we really wanted to help institutions understand their commitment to impact. And, and once you've made a commitment to impact, do you have clarity about what you mean? And do you have clarity about roles? And do people in impact roles have clarity about what they're doing? And if they know what they're doing, are they connected to the other people on campus who are also doing this work? And then those people, remember I said the who, um, what are the competencies and how does the institution help build competencies of the people who are doing this work? And ultimately, how does the institution support co-production? And co-production is collaborations between academics and non-academic partners. The evidence in, um, in knowledge mobilization or research impact shows that while we can transfer knowledge to a third party, a non-academic party, the, the uh, most robust forms of evidence occur when we co-produce with that third party. There's a paper written by Ian Bowen, um, sorry, Ian Graham and Sarah Bowen in 2013 that said the failure to, to bridge the knowledge to action gap, that's the, not, the gap between what we know and what we do, the failure to bridge the knowledge to action gap is not a failure of knowledge uh, transfer, it's a failure of knowledge production. So it's not that we are not transferring information effectively, it's that we're not producing the information that end users want. 
And, and um, in the q and I've got some examples of this that, that I can share. And so we have these five elements in the Institutional Health Check Workbook, commitment, clarity, connectivity, competencies, and co-production. And I'm just gonna show you the commitment questions because all of these look like this. This has 12 questions uh, for commitment. Some of the elements have five or six or seven, but while asking the question, it is you, you answer yes in part or no, or you don't know. Is there an organizational impact strategy? So think about, does Kiel have an impact strategy? We'll be coming to that. If you have an impact strategy, you tech yes. Next question, is there an impact implementation plan? A strategy is what you want to happen. An implementation plan is how are you going to do that? And if you have an implementation plan, then you check yes. You go through these 12 questions and then um, you count up the number of yeses you have. And if you have one, two or three yeses up down below on the diagnosis, if you have one, two or three, you get an A. This isn't like college where you get an A is a good mark, A is a bad mark. But if you have 11 or 12, you get an E and an E is a good mark. And this definition of commitment is, is the organization committed to impact? Do you have the right strategies, the right systems, the right staff? And so you, you, you assess um, the institution according to commitment, and this can also be done at a, um, at a center level, a university research um, unit level, um, or it could be done at the institution or a department level, or maybe a faculty level. And so uh, what I do not advise is that this is done at the individual level. We have another tool that I'm gonna be presenting to you in a moment. And so you count up the number of yeses, you give yourself a score, and um, this is the example of um, the strategic plan from the University of Melbourne. And um, they have five priorities um, across the top, embrace our place, a vibrant, diverse community, students at the heart of the university, at the leading edge of discovery, and you lead and convene and collaborate through strategic partnerships. And so what I've done is circled those actions in each of these which have a connection to impact. So the first on the left, partner with governments and others in growing the knowledge economy locally and globally. It's that partnering with governments and others, that partnering is an impact mechanism advanced reconciliation and reciprocal learning with indigenous peoples and communities. And anytime we do work with indigenous communities, it's always an element of trying to make things better. And I'll just not go through all of them, but on the right hand side, the last one, lead on global challenges where we can make a significant contribution to the world and develop centers of excellence that are global in reach, ambition and impact. So um, there are nine of these 18 um, elements that have um, a, an explicit part of impact. And this is Melbourne's um, uh, plan that just came out earlier in the summer. So a bit of a question, and I'm gonna pause a little to see if anyone's gonna write anything in the comments, David, but this is the Kiel's strategic plan um, called Our Future. And very much right at the front, it is making a difference in society by undertaking world leading research that transforms understanding and brings benefit, um, uh, to, brings benefit to communities and individuals. And so um, I've read your, your strategy. Um, I hope you all have read your strategy. What I have found is that there are four of 21 actions that are explicitly around impact. And there are a number of other actions that re are responding to openness and permeable elements of the university. But David, I wonder if anyone's putting anything in the comment box, if they have an opinion of our future, the Keele University strategy with respect to impact. At the moment, David, I'm not picking up any, uh, any comments that are coming through. Let me just check the Q&A. Nothing in the Q&A and uh, going back to the, um, to the to the chat line. Um, no, I'm not picking up anything at the moment. OK, perfect. Well, thank you. Um, so I do believe that um, Kiel's um, strategy is enabling for impact. I think there's an opportunity possibly to um, look at additional actions that might be that might um, build the impact capacity. Um, Melbourne had nine out of 18 active actions that were explicitly impact related. Kiel's got four out of 21. I'm not saying that four is bad, but maybe there's an opportunity to look at the Kiel University strategy, look at the other existing elements and maybe think how how we can wrap those around an impact agenda. And so having done the Institutional Health Check Workbook and you've looked at the five elements of co-production, commitment, connectivity, competencies and clarities, the, the tool helps you create, a, uh, the tool asks you to create a spider plot. So where do you have an E, which is in the outside ring? Where do you have an A, which is in the inside ring? And that shows you where you've got strengths and where you've got some gaps. 
And so it allows you to do a prescription under each one. It encourages you to create some actions um, to say, how are we going to improve? And this becomes a question of strategy for the institution. It's not my position to say, should you choose something that is a C and try and make it an E? In fact, it's good, but it's not great. Or do you really want to choose something that is really not good as an A and put the effort into bringing that up? And that is a strategic decision for the institution, but it invites you to create the prescription and invites you to monitor that prescription at 16, 12, and 24 months. So it's a tool for capturing, um, for doing an institutional self-assessment. I'll just pause and see if there's any questions on this before I move to the next tool, David. I'm just checking for you, David, to see if there's anything coming through. Um, not getting anything in the chat line at the moment and um just at the moment um let me just check i've got two new two new comments but um they don't appear to be about um about this so okay uh, nothing nothing to re nothing to report so so far thank you um, and so moving on this is the other tool and this is one looking at individual impact literacy and it's called the Impact Literacy Workbook. Again, the, um, the link to the site on Emerald Publishing is live um, on this and do click on it when you get these slides sent to you. And uh, it, it starts um, on the table of contents with a little bit of background of what is impact, what is knowledge mobilization, what is impact literacy. I'm gonna pause on that. I'm gonna tell you because um, there's not a lot of appreciation between the difference between impact and knowledge mobilization. Impact in the word of evaluators, impact is what we want to have happen. It's the thing that we're trying to make and knowledge mobilization are methods that we do to affect the impact. In evaluation words, impact is the dependent variable. It's the thing that we measure and knowledge mobilization or knowledge translation um, are, the, are the methods, they're the independent variables. They're the th interventions we do to observe, an uh, to observe a change on the, independent, on the dependent variable or impact. So knowledge mobilization is a how and impact is a what. And so they're, they're very tightly related. So the elements of the plan um, asks you first to, it's a tool that asks you to fill in um, blocks. It says, what is the problem you're trying to address? That's number four, it's the first thing we think of. And then how do you frame the impact for your particular piece of research or flip the problem? So um, if your problem is rates of teenage pregnancy, flipping the problem is less uh, lower rates of teenage pregnancy. But are you really going to lower print, um, teenage pregnancy in the scope of your three or five year grant um, application? Possibly not. But so we then ask within the flipping the problem, what's the specific thing that you're going to look at that addresses the problem? And perhaps you're going to be looking at getting um, culturally, um, culturally appropriate information for family planning into the hands of newcomers into your, into your local region. Right? And so that could be your piece. So we, we, when I work with our researchers, I want them to dream big and think big, but I also want them to get real and think what's their piece of this that they can reasonably um, uh, accomplish. Get Dream big and think of the long-term impacts, but within the three to five years of this grant application, where are you going to get to along that pathway? And then um, what are the indicators and the evidence that you are making progress along that pathway? And who are your stakeholders and your beneficiaries? There's um, uh, with, with co-producing impact, which is the next one, you need to know who your partners are. And, and especially when you're dealing with, um, with health research, medical research, or uh, research involving um, uh, human populations, there's a concept that we, call, we say not, nothing about us without us. And so how are you identifying those stakeholders and beneficiaries? How are you engaging them throughout the research cycle? And that leads you into co-producing the impact and what are the methods you're going to do and how are you going to help build capacity of your partners to be authentic partners, equal partners with a different set of knowledge. It's not that the academy and those old ivory towers that the academy has knowledge and community doesn't. It's that the academy has one type of expertise and the, not, and the community or industry or government or people with lived experience have another type of expertise. So we look to balance power. We look to create um, equity between different knowledges. And then um, how do you mobilize your knowledge? What are the methods of, um, of dissemination of stakeholder engagement? And then finally, what are the challenges and facilitators? And having worked through this workbook, you, you end up with this canvas at the back and you see on the left-hand side, what's your big problem? And then on the top left, what's your specific problem? A brief on the type of research you're doing, 
that then leads you down into different stakeholders or to the right onto your knowledge mobilization, which sort of leads to direct impacts and which can lead to next steps and overall impact. And so you get this canvas of, of, um, of, of, imp of an impact plan. And what I do with my researchers at York University in Canada is I sit with them and I help them work through this workbook. And I help them get this plan even before they start writing the, the impact strategy of the grant application. Because what I often find when I work with our um, academics is they tend to have the goal of impact okay in their head. Um, they, they're okay on the activities that they want to do because they all think of dissemination. I'm going to put up a website, I'm going to create a clear language, um, clear language research snapshot or do a policy brief. But they're very, they're less um, aware of methods of co-production and the method, the indicators of impact for your direct impacts or your overall impact, they're very poor on that. And so I work with them through these tools if they give me enough time before the grant deadline that is, and um, to create this canvas so that then if their impact strategy is one page or two pages or four pages, depending on the size of the grant, they've got all the raw material assembled in one place. And so just as um, another opportunity to get some more information is that Emerald has picked up this work and they are um, they have made these tools freely available, but they're also developing them as online tools. And um, because of the pandemic, the development has paused for a little bit, but you can still go to the impactservices.emerald.com and you can take a look. That is uh, me on the top left and Julie, and they've got um, an embarrassing number of videos of us talking about impact, but you can watch that video. Uh, but do go to Emerald because there are services and tools that are freely available for you. And so um, this is another slide though that I don't know if it's even going to be working um, because, um, but to become a permeable, permeable university, Keel must prioritize institutional literacy, individual literacy, both, or you've got a bright idea about something else. And I'm just going to pause to see if that has, David, has that popped up on your handheld? I'm just looking at the, I'm just looking I'm at the chat line. That, yeah, I'm looking I'm, at the chat. Oh, oh, it is working. There we go. I didn't know if it would work because I restarted the, the slide deck. But I'm suspecting that other people may have, um, the Slido might have cut out because it was asking me to install updates. So um, I'm going to take the two people who have voted that said both, and I would agree with you <laughs> that um, that uh, both is an F, don't, don't unvote in visual if that's what you want. Um, that, that there are opportunities to build institutional literacy, individual literacy, or to look at both. I'll tell you though, it's interesting when, um, and it depends, we keep our audience in mind. Our audience is primarily postgraduate and undergraduate researchers and um, on students and um, their focus would be on individuals right but they're also academic administrators and academic leaders whose focus is often going to be on the institution and so i am um, very pleased that there are um, both a number of opinions and what i would like david is to invite the person who are the people who have said something else if you have something else and another idea i invite you to put that in the chat box on the team's site and then, um, David, if you would uh, read out those um, and any of those other ideas that uh, we might be able to crowdsource. Certainly will, David. I'll start off by just um, uh, bringing in a comment from um, from our vice chancellor, actually, Ke um, Trevor McMillan, who's who's with us this evening. Um, and it picks up on a lot of the work that you were explaining around the self-assessment of impact and the kind of um, support structures and tools and so on that we provide. And, and Trevor makes the point because he's been centrally involved in the development of the um, the Knowledge Exchange Concordat um, with, with Research England, that the Knowledge Exchange Concordat published in May requires a self-assessment of knowledge uh, of knowledge exchange. So, so the emphasis that you've been placing on the importance of self-assessment assessment, framing the question around what kind of impact you want to achieve. It's very much embedded in the kind of um, self-assessment mechanisms that are being developed um, that are being developed in the UK. And, and I can speak from the perspective of um, the work that we've done on public engagement that uses a tool very similarly similar to the one that, that, that you have around is there support, is there reward and recognition? And so this is, uh, I mean, this is this is a framework. I think that that um, that our uh, that our that our institution really needs to, you know. 
I do apologise. That's my answer machine. There's not much you can do about that. No, no, it decides no. to go off. So, um, so, so, yeah. That's just a comment from, uh, as I say, from 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 our VC, who's deeply, um, you know, deeply immersed in these uh, in these questions. I'm just going to well, go back and look at the at the uh, at the uh, chat line as well. And, and while you're doing that, David, um, an, an offer to your VC and those other uh, on-campus stakeholders who are working on those self-assessment tools. If this institutional impact um, health check is helpful, I'd be happy to do a, a bit of a deep dive with you and a bit more of a webinar just on that tool, just to see if it provides any um, inspiration for the self-assessment uh, that it seems like um, Research England is going to require you to do. Absolutely, that would be that. That's very valuable. Thank you, David. So shall we move on, David? Any other comments? I'm just going to go back to the. Um, I'm just going to go back. To... Not at the moment, David, so okay. so maybe if you just keep. Um, keep well, moving this on. is my last slide, David, and um, those of you who um, answered the first slide or if you didn't answer and you've learned something in this slide use the chat box for the teams not the zoom site use the chat box for the teams and from a scale of one to ten have you moved any where have you gone from i didn't answer and now i feel i've got some knowledge or i had some knowledge and maybe i've gone up a little bit so put that number from one to ten in the chat box and i'll ask david to look at it and see if he thinks that we've moved the needle in 45 minutes with a technical disruption I'm just looking at the uh, I'm just looking at the chat box. Nothing's coming through at the moment, but then um, Jake informed me earlier on that there can be um, a little bit of a delay. So um, yeah. we can just wait to see if some more uh, some more reflections are coming through. Okay. Just bear with me for a moment. I'm just going to yeah, go sure. back to the so, um, to the to, to, to the to the Q and A. Yeah. So as you're looking at that, so this is my last slide. Um, and I do thank you for um, the opportunity to present. Apologies as my system started to update and then shut everything down. But um, we, this is what we do when we are per, um, presenting um, virtually. And I do um, thank you for your attention and just come back to the chat box, David. Any uh, have we overcome our reticence to put numbers in? No, I think people are still um, reflecting on on where they stand in the uh, in the numerical ranking. So we've encouraged self assessment, uh, and I think they're thinking about it really carefully at the moment, David. So uh, I th and I think that's to do with, um, with 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 the impact of thinking about you know how 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 where they sit on the scale. So so take that as a as a positive. And and I imagine one's name is identified with one's number. That should not um, in, in intimidate you um, at all. I do hope that um, that this has been nonetheless interesting and informative. And David, I, I know that had I been there in person, we'd have had the opportunity to do some workshops and have some conversations. Um, and uh, that may still be on the cards when we're all able to travel again. But I do think this has been a wonderful way just to hopefully get your audience thinking and considering whether impact is the grand challenge of grand challenges. David, thank you so much for your for your lecture. Um, it's been it's been really rewarding um, to, to 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 listen to um, the way in which you have uh, developed a whole range of, uh, of of tools. We can see many crossovers, many opportunities, and we do really want to continue um, that conversation with you about the importance of uh, of impact. You also very helpfully, I think, distinguished between um, knowledge mobilization um, and 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 impact. And I think that's a that's a lesson that we can that we can really you know that we can really learn um, because you're you're absolutely right that the notion of pathways to impact has been removed from our um, from our grant writing um, uh, disciplines uh, recently. But to think about knowledge mobilization, I think, can still give us that space to think about precisely about the how um, and how we and how we get there. So, 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 David, is it okay David, if I'm? Can I just say one thing um, sure. on that? The, lo the loss of the pathways to impact um, doesn't mean that impact is gone. 
right? No, no, no. So, um, but it does, um, it does, I think, signal a maturation of the impact agenda. And I'll use Canada as an example. Um, the majority of grant um, um, grant programs still require a knowledge mobilization or a knowledge translation strategy, except the last one that rolled out the very large scale grant applications, $24 million over six years, called the New Frontiers Transformation Round. They are explicitly driven by a need beyond the academy. So it, by a social, health, environmental, economic need that needs to be articulated. But there is no, and it is expected that the research will help address that need. So an impact plan, there's no section for impact plan. It sure. needs to be embedded within the research plan. And so I think this is very, very um, positive because what we would often see is that the researchers spending all their time on their research strategy and taking the last 48 hours to do their impact, their pathway to impact. And right now they can't do that. It's got to be embedded. The partners, the types of um, of methods of, of knowledge mobilization or stakeholder engagement need to be baked in throughout the proposal. So in Canada, we're starting to see not the loss of impact, but the integration of impact with research. Absolutely. Thank you for that, David. So I, I, what I'm what we're beginning to get now. Um, are a whole range of reflections uh, and questions. So if it's OK by you, I'm going to start putting some of those questions to you um, yes. from members from members of the uh, from the audience. So so one one of our audience members um, puts the challenge this way in terms of institutional strategies. It's both the diversity of strategies and their rapid change over time um, that I find challenging. For some reason, it seems to be rare that a strategy has a lifespan to become fully embedded in the institution. Is this a commonplace um, in, in, in universities? Uh, I, I think many of us can say the answer to that is yes. Uh, we experienced it in Canada. Um, you know, the, the only thing that doesn't change is the fact that we always have to change. Um, and, and that is being driven in my opinion or in my experience in Canada by a lot of external factors. The universities aren't changing because we think it's good for change is good in and of itself. But we're responding to new public policies in Canada, as in the UK, equity, diversity and inclusivity is a is now a key component. And so all of us have had to develop EDI strategies on campus, but also implement EDI in our grant applications. And that's something that is very important and nobody objects to it. But that's that's come um, from the outside. Uh, similarly, in Canada, um, we through the events of this summer, uh, very many of us are now looking at anti-black racism as um, as a focus point. And in Canada and other countries, um, decolonization and indigenous research now um, are taking priority. So I would say that yes, the pace of change is um, increasing, and I do think it is very hard to create strategies that are have long enough life in them to really be able to make a difference that often our strategies are catching up to the external environment as opposed to the other way around. That's really helpful. So the moral is a kind of strategy is for a longer life than we often give it. It's not just for Christmas. It is actually for um, for really developing and embedding over 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 time. I think university leaders are probably guilty of, of trying to develop too many um, strategies at too rapid, um, rapid a pace. So actually just so while I would I, say I would, I would agree with you, but I wouldn't put the onus on the university leadership. The university leadership is responding to the pressures that are coming outside. And that's one of my earlier slides about the impact agendas that we are now um, driven by externalities as opposed to universities who used to be built to resist external influence. I mean, this is this is how universities were set up is to create a place of of, of um, inquiry that uh, was not in, in was not driven by external influence. And so we've got a 600 year old business model that we're now changing very rapidly. That's really helpful clarification. Just to um, there are some other questions, but I just also want to intersperse that with um, some colleagues whose reflections about the the impact of your lecture and their self assessment of where they stand in um, in their understanding of the, the impact agenda. Some of those are beginning to come through now. So I'd just like to share with you one um, colleague who um, has indicated that uh, they now will place their understanding of impact at a, at a seven um, and will be able to do more as a result of the sharing of the workbooks that you've um, that you've that you've shared with us um, 
tonight. So um, a number of uh, people have included, including one colleague um, who's, 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 whose knowledge has gone up by uh, 0.5 of a percent. They started as eight and they've gone up to they've gone up to 8.5. Um, I'll take it. So, so the, the, I just remember that one coming coming through and being able to uh, to to to, uh, to 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 balance that. So um, a lot of interest in the uh, a lot of interest in, in 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 the workbook. So I think that's been really helpful facilitation. Another question that's coming through. Um, it, it is from um, Trevor McMillan, our vice chancellor. So. Um, Trevor asks, do we need a new term rather than research impact? Does it overstress the one way flow rather than the co-production that you rightly highlight? And, and, you, and you made, um, I think correctly, a, a great deal of the importance of co-production and it's, it's an activity that we really value. Yeah, um, so, so the language in um, Canada, if you are in the social sciences, we use the word knowledge mobilization. The, if you are in the health sciences, we use the terms knowledge translation. If you're in the states, you use broader impacts. Um, uh, Vice Chancellor, it is um, if we could have, I think if we could have a single term, we would have had by now. I can tell you that um, I run a knowledge mobilization unit because our primary work is in the social sciences and humanities, and that is the term of the um, social sciences and humanities research council. If I was in a faculty of health, I'd probably be running a knowledge translation unit. So um, the, the terms are important, but as a practitioner, not a scholar, I let the practitioners um, argue about the minutiae between the terms and um, I'm just busy enough getting it done. But my preference would be to, to really think, not necessarily change the word impact, but refine what we mean by it and have a have a term or a concept that links these these the how and the what because um, I think we get, um, we don't have a sophisticated um, uh, uh, understanding between how and what, and they're mutually related, but I do think they're different. So um, I am open to new terms, but I'm not necessarily motivated by them. But um, Vice Chancellor, if you've got a good idea, welcome to hear it. We'll put you in touch directly afterwards, uh, <laughs> David. I, I just want to, just again, to, to, to intersperse this with some um, reflections from uh, from guests who uh, whose perspective has moved. So we have one colleague who um, moved from a one to a three uh, okay. in the in the space of um, the, 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 the lecture. Um, another question um, around communities that are hard to reach uh, and we, we, we hear this as a term a lot in public engagement activity. And so um, just thinking about that notion of hard to reach, should we turn it round? Should we reverse it? Can it be that it's not the communities that are hard to reach, but it's the institutions? That is, um, that is a very insightful comment. Uh, I would first say before you ask your question, I would want to understand why are we hard to reach? Because different contexts create different types of hard. And in the Canadian context, for example, with Indigenous research, um, it is never the institution that needs to reach out. It is the Indigenous community that needs to reach out to the researchers. In fact, we have protocols um, in place to guide th those types of relationship development. Um, I do think the, the if we are a permeable university, then I hope we are rate, we are reducing the barriers and make it easier to reach in. Um, so I would agree with that comment. If we're an ivory tower, um, I would absolutely think it is difficult to reach in. And I can tell you that the knowledge mobilization unit that we have under the Vice President Research and Innovation, one of its jobs is to pick up the phone when somebody calls because we are monolithic institutions and it's hard to find out where people sit, where expertise sits. For example, at York University, we have one of Canada's leading um, researchers in youth homelessness and he's in the Faculty of Education. Well, if you're a community organization looking to engage with a homelessness researcher, you're not going to think to call the Faculty of Education. So call us, call the Knowledge Mobilization Unit because it's our job to connect you with that with that researcher who might be ready for you. It's also, um, uh, please don't cold call my researchers, I say, because for number one, they don't know you and they're not going to call you back. 
Or number two, if they do call you back, um, you might not have a positive experience because maybe they're not interested in working in collaboration. So we try and find the right researcher who is in a space in his or her year or career that is interested in doing this work and not overload teaching and not about to go on a parental leave. And so we we provide that function as a brokerage. And so we do we do want to make um, we do want to make the institution easier to reach. That's great. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. And thank you. To, I wanted to thank in advance all the questioners who've put some really stimulating points in the chat line. I just want to finish with one final question, David, and it's quite a big picture question uh, that I think it's, it's important that we think about. Is there a risk in a post COVID world that the only research that governments can afford to fund will be that with a short term impact? And we know that impacts are long term. Maybe just try and gaze a little bit into the future about what the future holds for us in a very uncertain time. Yeah, so so COVID, like nothing in my experience, has created the moral obligation for research to make a difference. Um, and so, um, and it needs to make a difference in the short term, I would agree with you. But I, I hadn't actually thought about might this create precedence for future beyond COVID, and that is a very interesting thought that I think we all need to um, say I hope not, and maybe think about that proactively, um, because okay, so so I, as I think through this, getting a vaccine, we need that, we need that quickly. Understanding from a public health perspective how different nations' public health responses have created differential impacts on, on infections or hospitalizations or deaths, that's a longer term question, right? So I do think that um, there may be some short term um, culture developed around COVID, but I would hope, I would expect still there are some significant questions that will be coming after um, we have got um, we have got on top of the COVID pandemic that nonetheless are still going to be encouraging long term impacts from research. So um, the answer is I think there's a risk. I hope it won't happen. And I think we should all be mindful to um, to to not uh, I don't say not let it happen, but to consider ways to address that that risk. David, thank you very much for that very carefully considered, thoughtful answer. Thank you for an outstanding um, lecture. We've braved um, some of the challenges of technology and I think we've come through them admirably. Thank you so much for joining us from Canada um, this our evening, your your yeah. afternoon. Um, it's been a real pleasure to um, to listen to you and to and, to, and co to converse with you online. So as is my pleasure. Our sincere thanks to this evening's speaker, um, Dr. David Phipps. And, and just before we finish off, um, one or two thank yous to those who've helped with the smooth running of this event. Rob Stannard, Liberal, Pro, uh, Liberal Arts Programme Director, uh, Helen Cuddy in our events and conferences team, and Dave and Jake in our AVS team, and of course all the colleagues in ILAS, including Steve Kilner, who has played an important linchpin role in all of this and of course to you the audience for your support and contributions to the grand challenges um, lectures and, and always uh, as I've already acknowledged some really great questions just to remind you and you how you should have it on your on your screen in front of you our next grand challenges lectures lecture will be presented by Andrew Copson he's the chief executive of humanists UK and president of humanists international on Wednesday the 4th of November and Andrew's lecture is titled politics religion and freedom is secularism failing and does it matter in the meantime have a great evening or a great afternoon wherever you are our thanks again to David and please let's give him a metaphorical clap thank you thank you good night everybody good night